Get your Bible open. This is called the Summary of Romans. We're going to go from Romans chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 16, verse 27. And let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we begin. Father, I thank you so much for your word. You told uh, Paul, told Timothy to give his attention to exhortation and doctrine and to the reading of God's word. And you said, blessed are all those who read. And so I pray, dear Lord, that as we listen to God's word, we know faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And Lord, we pray you'll draw many people to the Lord Jesus because of it. And we thank you in the wonderful name of our Messiah, our blessed Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the theme of Romans is righteousness by faith. That is very clear. It's two key words. They appear many times. And there's an introduction in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 17. And in this introduction, we have the character of the gospel presented to us in the opening seven verses. So follow along as I read. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. He begins verse 8, goes down to verse 15 on concern for the gospel after telling us the character of it. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purposed to come unto you, but was let or hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah or of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He obviously has moved to the content of the gospel, for therein, in it, the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, quoting from Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Now, beginning at chapter 1, verse 18, and will take us clear to the end of chapter 8, verse 39, we have the principles of the righteousness of God. And there are four of them. We have, first of all, condemnation. And that will take us from chapter 1, verse 18, down to chapter 3, verse 20. In the last part of the first chapter, we have the condemnation of those who reject the revelation of God. God has revealed himself. The heavens declare the glory of God. The expanse shows the work of his hands. And we need to recognize that. Man's accountable for that. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They hold it down. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Greek word is poema, from which we get English poem. God has a poem about himself in creation even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, 
but became vain or empty, and their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed or exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image make like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and all God's people said, amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meet or fitting. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So right away, Paul condemns those who reject the revelation of God. And three times we read, God gave them up. Now, a lot of people, when they hear the reading of Scripture, perhaps are not comfortable because you don't hear that often. Sad is the fact that many churches don't read God's Word again. I read a lot of Bible, give a lot of verses, and any normal message, this one is a little unusual as we go through the entire book. But it reminds me of the farmer in Iowa who told me, have you ever fed hogs? And I said, no, sir, I never have. He said, well, I didn't think you had. We don't dump the whole load on them at once. I'm not trying to dump the whole load on you, but I believe one of the greatest blessings we can have is to see the entire book at one panoramic view. And that's what we're doing. So the principle of condemnation, chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20 first of all, condemns those who reject the revelation of God. Secondly, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, he condemns those who rebuke others while ignoring their own deeds. Boy, is that a common problem. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. By the way, the word without excuse in chapter 1, verse 20 is the same word translated inexcusable here in chapter 2, verse 1. Both are without excuse. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality they will get eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what do they get? Indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. Upon every soul that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there's no respect to persons with God, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, 
their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So he condemned those who reject the revelation of God. And now in chapter 2, verse 1 to 16, condemns those who rebuke others while ignoring their own deeds. Now the third uh, group of people that come under his condemnation, he rebukes those who rely upon their own standards of righteousness. And that could be many of us, for lots of folks think they're religious And therefore, by scoring points, they'll somehow make it to heaven. But that's opposite of what God teaches. In chapter 2, verse 17, he said, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth and the law. Thou, therefore, which teacheth another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, which many of them do, as you know, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature... If it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. What advantage then hath the Jew? And what profit is there of circumcision? Well, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, or certainly not. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. Now, the fourth group of people that he condemns are not only those who reject the revelation of God in creation and those who rebuke others while ignoring their own deeds and those who rely upon their own standards of righteousness, but he now comes to the matter of affecting everybody, those who refuse to follow the way of the Lord. Let's look at it beginning of verse 9 down to verse 20. What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, they're all under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. 
Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Folks, Paul just finished telling us why we're all condemned and in need of a Savior. You may be here with religious background. You may be here with a lot of effort you've tried to put into being good. And maybe you think that all your good deeds are greater and much larger and vast uh, in, in proportion to what you have done bad. And that somehow God, to be just and fair, should let you into heaven on the basis of that. Well, that whole argument is just obliterated here in the opening three chapters of Romans. We are all guilty before God. We are all sinners. And so the question is, now that man is a sinner and condemned, as the Bible teaches, what hope is there for any of us? And that brings us to principle number two of the God's, of God's righteousness that goes from chapter 3, verse 21, to chapter 5, verse 21. We call it justification. Actually, in the Greek, it's the same word translated righteousness. Justification is not an act of man. That is the biggest misunderstanding in reading Romans. It's not an act that you and I do. It's an act of God, a decision he makes based on what Jesus did. You are not declared righteous because you're a good person or got great potential. You are declared righteous because Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again from the dead. And that is the fundamental issue of Romans. Let's read it, beginning at chapter 3, verse 21, on justification. We learn, first of all, in the last part of chapter 3, that it's dependent totally upon the work of Jesus Christ. But now, I love the way that changes from all that condemnation talk. Now it says, but now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a word for the mercy seat in the Old Testament tabernacle and temple. God set him forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission or forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just or righteous and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Well, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. It's dependent on the work of Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, verses 1 to 25, it's described in the life of Abraham. If you want to learn what it is to be justified by faith, then study Abraham, the father of us all. What shall we say then? By the way, all these what then and what shall we say then? Anybody who's Jewish knows when he reads this book, this is a Jewish book. What shall we say then? Jews keep asking questions till they drive you batty. And uh, we Jews, we, we look at this different than a lot of Gentiles do, but it's a very Jewish book. It's like a, a rabbinical teacher had gone through catechism. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? This is from Genesis 15, verse 6 a key verse in your Bible. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Very uh, mathematical accountant term. Put to your count. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. God would owe you something because of what you did. But to him that worketh not, 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, this is from Psalm 32, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Put it to your account. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. That's a powerful point. Abraham became a believer before he was circumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. Why did God do it this way? That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed, it was put to his account for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. It's not in the text at this point, but all God's people said... What a joy to learn that we are declared righteous by faith alone. And God proves the problem uh, clearly in the life of Abraham. Now, justification is not only dependent on the work of Jesus Christ and described in the life of Abraham, but in the first 11 verses of chapter 5, it's declared in the rewards of our salvation. They don't come because you're scoring points with God now, trying to have lots of good works before him. Oh, we do good works that we might glorify our Father which is in heaven. And true genuine faith produces proper fruit. But my dear friends, God's reward of being with him forever is based on your faith and what Jesus has already done. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Do you have that? Through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, 
much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God to our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement or the reconciliation as it is in the Greek text. Now, a fourth thing about justification is brought up in the last part of chapter 5, and that is that it's demonstrated in the results of the fall. You see, everything that happened to the human race was in the mind and plan of God before he ever created it. He knew exactly what was going to happen and how it related to the wonderful gospel of our Lord. Here's what it says. Wherefore, as by one man, namely Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed or put to your account when there's no law, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude or likeness of Adam's transgression, who's the figure, the symbol of him that was to come, the last Adam, who's Christ. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, praise God, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. First, condemnation. Why are all men lost and guilty before God? Second, justification. How can a man be right before God? And it's not based on human effort or performance, but on an act of God by which he declares you and me righteous because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Third principle of righteousness, sanctification. Goes from chapter 6, verse 1 to chapter 7, verse 25. Once again, we learn sanctification is not the efforts and works of man like is so often taught. No, we learn that sanctification is again an act of God by which he separates us from the consequences of sin, death, and hell, and even beyond that, separates us from the power of sin to control us and make us slaves. What beautiful words. Again, the rabbinical questioning method. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, certainly not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, literally has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That's not the word annihilate. It's the word kartageo, meaning to render inoperative. The body of sin, this principle of sin in my life, has been rendered inoperative. Why? That henceforth we should not serve sin. I don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. He that is dead is freed or justified from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. These first 10 verses deal 
uh, with a simple fact, and that is our realization of certain facts. Notice verse 3, 6, and 9 all tell us to know something. The application hasn't come yet. But you will never get to the application and living victoriously over sinful habits until you know the facts. These facts are true whether you understand them or not. That brings us to verse 11. From verse 11 to verse 23, we have our responsibility to these facts. Likewise, he says, reckon, that's a, an accounting term again, count it to be so. Reckon, it's a word of faith. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Notice he didn't say reckon sin to be dead. Sin's not dead, very much alive. You reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Absolutely not. Know you not that to whom you yield yourself, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which has delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, remember that back from chapter 3, verse 21. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the opening 10 verses of chapter 6, we have our realization of certain facts. In the last half of chapter 6, our responsibility to these facts. Now in chapter 7, our relationship to the law. Very troubling situation here. What is our attitude toward the law? Is the law no good? Should we just not pay attention to it anymore? Chapter 7. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law, so that she's no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, 
working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now that it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Everybody following? I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now these principles of God's righteousness, condemnation, why we're lost and guilty before God, justification, how we're declared righteous before a holy God, sanctification, how we're separated from sin, death, and hell, its consequences and its power to control us. But the key, the real key to it all is in chapter 8. We call it security. It could be called glory road. (laughs) You see, uh, in chapter 6, the key word is sin. In chapter 7, the key word is law. But in chapter 8, the key word is spirit. The need in all of our lives is the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I hope this will be a blessing to you. Security, you see, first of all, in the opening 17 verses, is given to us by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. If we didn't have that, we'd all be an emotional roller coaster. Let's read about it. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh, boy, is this the truth, do mind the things of the flesh, But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Man, that's terrific. Security is given by the presence of the Holy Spirit. But secondly, it's grounded in our hope. Verses 18 to 25. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Anybody got any pains here? And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the redemption, the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Our wonderful security is not only given by the presence of the Holy Spirit and grounded in our hope, but it's guaranteed by the facts. Look at these wonderful facts from verse 26 to the end. First, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And how about this fact, God's wonderful purpose. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said, what a glorious security we have. It starts no condemnation, and it ends with no separation because of the wonderful love of God. Well, after these great principles of God's righteousness, he presents some problems, one of which deals with the rejection of Israel in chapter 9. And you see that in the sorrow of Paul in the opening five verses. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Messiah, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. You see the burden, the sorrow of Paul. You also see the rejection of Israel in the selection of the seed in verses 6 to 13. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Boy, that's for sure. Neither because of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. 
as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. You see, the rejection of Israel, folks, is not only seen in Paul's sorrow and in the selection of the seed, but in the sovereignty of God. We now enter a wonderful but very difficult section, verses 14 to 24, the sovereignty of Almighty God. He saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us? whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So what if God wants to do that? How can we question it? You also see the rejection of Israel in the scriptures that prophesied it. Verse 25. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people which are not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where I have said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, Except the Lord of Sabaoth, armies, hosts, hath left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now from the rejection of Israel, he moves in chapter 10 to the reception of Gentiles, pointing out the nature of God's righteousness in the opening 13 verses, and the necessity of, of hearing that message, for Israel was to be a light to those nations, just like the Messiah, but they failed to do so. But God's opportunity has exploded in what we call the last days, from the day of Shavuot or Pentecost in Acts 2 until the end of the tribulation. Gentiles out of every nation, tribe, tongue, and people will come to know the Lord. For God says the Hebrew prophets will pour out his spirit on all the nations and the Gentiles. Wow. We'll learn he's not done with the Jews in just a moment. In chapter 10, verse 1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Messiah, or Christ, is the end, the completion of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He fulfilled it all. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Messiah down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Messiah again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee or near you, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. 
That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich in all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And How should they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Well, in chapter 11, we have hope. There's the restoration. In fact, the remnant is proof in the opening six verses. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, certainly no. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew, what you not what the Scripture saith of Elijah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, beginning at verse 7, we have the rejection being prophesied. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Verse 11 and 12 deals with the result of their fall. God forbid... But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and it has been, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles. Here's a direct statement in Romans to the Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. The reaction of the Gentiles here is very important to God. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, meaning Gentile, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partake us of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. 
For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Wow. Here's the revelation of a mystery. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness, which back in verse 11 and 12 means salvation, of the Gentiles be come in. That'll take us all the way to the end of the tribulation. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, their enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, their beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without it repentance. He's not going back on his word. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. And all God's people said. He put it there, that's where it belongs. To him be all the glory. Now we looked at the principles of God's righteousness and the problems. Beginning at chapter 12, verse 1. We go into the practices of the righteousness of God. In chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, he deals with living for the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That's everything he said in the first 11 chapters. That you present your bodies. He told you that back in chapter 6, verse 13. The word present is the same word yield in Greek. That you present or yield your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Take the mask off. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, whether prophecy, let's prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let's wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth, on teaching, or he that exhorteth, on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity." He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Living for the Lord, using our gifts. Then in verse 9, he brings up the key ingredient that makes that what it should be, and that's the love of the Lord. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, don't let it be hypocritical. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, 
I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Then in chapter 13, he brings up the law of God. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Then he goes into liberty. Him that is weak in the faith receive you but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not, therefore, judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for that man who eateth with offense." It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. 
And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. In chapter 15, he moves to the great Christian principle of like-mindedness. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive or accept one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about into Lyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, To whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all, and all God's people said. Chapter 16, the conclusion. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Kincrea, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saints, that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that's in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. 
Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbani, my, our helper in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Trophena and Trophosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Philasia, Hermas, Herobus, or Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And all God's people said, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsman, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and all God's people said. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven. We recognize that many, many years ago when the church was born, these precious saints had no Bibles of their own. And they read these letters and people listened. And we can only imagine the joy that came into their hearts. As they learned about God's great plan of salvation and how it should be applied in their personal lives on a day-to-day basis. Lord, I thank you for the Bible, the word of the living God. And I pray that each of us would be motivated in our own personal life to read it daily, to allow the message of God to sink deep into our hearts. There's so much religious jargon and theological misunderstandings and confusion in our world. And it's so refreshing to come to the simplicity and glory and majesty of your word. Father, I don't know the hearts of people who have listened. But I know you're the God who said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I pray, Lord, by hearing that the just shall live by faith. When we heard that by the deeds of the law, no one will be justified. We learned so clearly that Jesus paid it all that it's only by faith in him. You said if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts God raised from the dead, we would be saved. God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit and your word, you would draw folks to the Lord Jesus who alone can give us life everlasting. Forgiveness is possible because he paid it all. Thank you, Lord. May we live in the light of what we have studied in this great book. May it make a difference in our lives. In the wonderful name of our Messiah, our blessed Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.